Good evening. I'm Mary McGee. I'm the executive director of the forum, and I am thrilled to welcome you to the forum, Columbia's newest resource and the gateway to Columbia's Manhattanville campus. We're thrilled also to be hosting tonight's Brain Insight Lecture. I just want to remind you to turn off all your electronic devices so you really can enjoy and engage with tonight's event. I want to point out to you the exits, the four exits. If you need to leave early, I would suggest you take one of the upstairs exits so you don't need to enter exit past uh, our speaker. Bathrooms are out the doorways to your left. And one other thing, tonight's lecture will be recorded, video recorded and broadcast, so you should be aware of that. And with that said, welcome, and I will introduce you to Professor Costa, the executive director, or the chief executive officer of the Zuckerman Institute. Good evening, everyone. It's really great to see such a turnout uh, at our first event at the forum. Uh, I hear there are people still wrapping around downstairs, but they'll come in as the lecture proceeds. So it's really my pleasure to introduce you to the first event of the Stavros Niarchos Foundation Brain Insight Lecture this year. And uh, tonight's event is going to be uh, special, and we're going to hear about how to find uh, the barcodes in our brain and how 100 billion neurons can have identity and connect uh, to each other. This wonderful uh, series of lectures is uh, made possible through the generosity of the Stavros Niarchos uh, foundation, and we really are grateful to have them as a partner in this. In addition to the series of lectures, lectures, a lot of these content is then transformed into content that goes out into the schools, into our education uh, program, and this teacher scholar program that's complementary is also sponsored by the Starburst Miracles uh, Foundation. So I would like to thank the foundation for this support. Thank you very much. <clears throat> this is really an exciting time for neuroscience at Columbia and for the Zuckerman Institute who is the building uh, right next to us, also uh, uh, designed by Renzo Piano. This is an institute where people interested in the brain, but from very diverse disciplines, uh, are working together to figure out uh, simple things that puzzle us, like, for example, how do we remember what we like and we don't like? How do we love and hate? How do we taste sweet? How do we smell? Uh, how are we uh, transforming the world, making decisions? And so I invite you, uh, and those of you that are new to this, uh, to follow us, to come to the lectures. There's uh, many other uh, events. And if you're interested in partnering with us, uh, and, and support. Many of you here have done that, thankfully. Um, you're welcome. This is going to be a great journey. We don't know when it's going to end, but it's going to be fantastic. And we remain honored to Mort Zuckerman for his uh, vision in uh, establishing and endowing this institute, to the Green Foundation for providing the wonderful building in which the institute is housed. And again, for many donors here, including uh, the Stavros Niarchos Foundation, uh, for the help in supporting this endeavor. Now, on to what matters. It is really, really a great honor and a pleasure, I'm a bit nervous, uh, to introduce Professor Tom Maniaris to you today. Uh, Tom Maniaris is really one of, of the greatest molecular biologists of all time. 
he uh, was the one that developed from fundamental recombinant DNA methods uh, that we all use uh, in our labs today. He pioneered the generation and screening of cDNA libraries and genomic libraries, leading us to uh, the discovery of many, many genes. He also used these methods to identify and characterize the DNA and RNA regulatory sequences. So what's happening there? And also uh, to find out how things like RNA splicing uh, works or how signal transduction pathways can actually control uh, gene regulation. He used this knowledge also to uh, with his team, cloned the first human gene. What's extraordinary about Tom is that not only he did all these tool developments and discoveries, but he didn't keep them to himself. He broadcast it to society and to science in general. And for example, I learned to, to work from he, the book he co-authored, uh, The Molecular Cloning Math Manual, which I think many of you that are in science or study here at Columbia um, uh, have used. And he has used this knowledge not only to find fundamental mechanisms really about biology, like what we're gonna hear today uh, about protocatenins, but also to have insights into diseases like ALS. So it's, it's not a surprise that Tom has had a brilliant and diverse career with positions at Cold Spring Harbor, at Caltech, at Harvard, and luckily for us, now at Columbia, where he's the Isidore Edelman uh, Professor at the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biophysics, and also my upstairs neighbor at uh, Zuckerman Institute. Uh, he continues to put his knowledge uh, at the service of the community. And so he's the co-founder and chairman of the New York Genome Center, and he's also the director of the Precision Medicine Initiative at the Columbia Medical Center. He has received many awards, including the Scientific Achievement Award from the American uh, Medical Association, uh, the Lasker Award, and he was elected to the National uh, uh, Academy of Sciences. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and also a member of the National Institute of Medicine. Tom is really an inspiration as a scientist and as a person, and as you will hear tonight, he continues to push discovery every day. We'll hear about the important role of protocoherence proteins in brain wiring, which is a complex but fascinating story. And I hope you'll appreciate the complexity, but also admire the capacity that Tom has of making things so complex accessible to everyone. Tom, thank you so much. It's really my pleasure to welcome you here. Thank you. Well, thank you, Rui, uh, for that uh, uh, very nice introduction. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank the uh, Stavros Narakis Foundation for uh, supporting this lecture and uh, the many other things they do both in New York City and, uh, and internationally. Uh, I'd like uh, also to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak and to uh, indicate at the outset that uh, I'm gonna try uh, to cover 20 years of work that's very complicated in 50 minutes. And uh, for a broad audience, so you'll please forgive me if I slip or I, I either say something too complex or too simple. So uh, as, it, uh, as it indicates in this slide, so the, the original 
Title is Finding the Barcodes in Our Brains, Using Genetics to Provide an Identity for the Brain's 100 Billion Neurons. Uh, I think that was done last May. Uh, and uh, I would like to add an alternative or uh, at the same time title, and that is How Genetics and Genomics Can Provide Insights into the Brain, uh, into brain Wiring and Neuropsychiatric Disease. And, uh, what this is really about is, is following mechanism. And uh, I should say that uh, I began this interest uh, on a very simple way on a bacteriophage lambda, uh, working in the laboratory of Mark Potashny, who's here tonight. And it was uh, that work that really began to crystallize how you look at a problem, how you really identify the details for how a machine works, how, uh, in this case, how gene expression works. And so uh, what you'll see, I hope, is that uh, starting uh, with the attempt to understand uh, a gene cluster, which I'll describe, has led one step to another from uh, gene regulations of protein structure uh, to mouse genetics. And uh, so I'll, I, I hope I can make it, uh, make it through this. So uh, start off a very simple, com uh, uh, very simple um, concept. Uh, and that is, uh, I'm going to describe two principles of neural circuit assembly. And, uh, and it's important uh, if you see, uh, oops, sorry. It's important that, uh, that you see there are many others uh, because it's obviously a very complex problem of how you assemble 100 billion neurons into a functional brain. And there are all sorts of things about guidance, how do neurons get to where they have to be, uh, how they engage and interact with each other in a specific way. And all those things are being studied uh, at the Zuckerman Institute. And I'm going to focus just on these two problems. The first one is uh, called self-avoidance. And uh, what that is is that neurites, exon and dendrites, of the same neuron must avoid each other to prevent clumping and non-uniform distribution. So what you see here, these are the dendrites uh, uh, extending from, uh, from the main body of the neuron, and at the end of the axon, these axon terminals. And both of these have to avoid clumping and getting in each other's way, so there has to be a mechanism for, for doing that. And also, it's important for individual neurons to tell themselves from others. They have to, when they're next, next to another neuron, they have to know who is who in order to make the right connection and to form the right circuits. And this is, uh, this is uh, illustrated here. You can see that uh, these are two neurons interacting. Uh, you can see their interactions between axon and dendrites uh, with the cell body uh, and, uh, and dendrites uh, with dendrites. And so all this complex interaction really requires every neuron to understand who they are. And so the question is, uh, how does that happen? And uh, the, the simple uh, description of this is shown here uh, in the wiring of the retina, which uh, the faculty uh, uh, works on here. And that is, uh, there is a, a series of uh, neural circuits that extend from the, neural, from the photoreceptors, which detect uh, light and color, uh, into the uh, transmission of this information to the brain. And so uh, among these cells are something called starburst amacrine cells, and they're at a particular layer in the retina, and uh, they interact with each other and with other neurons to form uh, the appropriate circuit. And this is how they look uh, in, in a planar view. And you can see each of these uh, have this, they're called starbursts because they are beautiful stars that uh, emanate from the, uh, from the cell body and extend. And you see they're all uniformly distributed. And moreover, so that's self-avoidance. They, they don't get tangled, the, the, the dendrites uh, don't get uh, tangled. But they see their neighbors as well. They touch their neighbors and they don't invade their neighbor's uh, 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 space. And in fact, uh, as shown here, they actually interact. So this is called heteroneural or non-self-discrimination. So this is just one small example of the kind of complexity that's, uh, that's required to, to build a functional circuit. And uh, the, uh, the presence of this, uh, these protocoherence, which I'll discuss, play an important role in that. <clears throat> 
So uh, what's shown here is the sort of sequence of events of uh, the laying down of this particular circuit. So uh, the cells start dividing. They, uh, they first display the self-avoidance so the dendrites do not uh, touch each other or, or, or uh, clump. Uh, they then tile, and then uh, in this tiling, engage their neighbors in a way that leads to uh, the assembly of a circuit. So what are the underlying mechanisms for self-avoidance and tiling? And as you'll see today, the ultimate answer lies in our genes in the proteins they encode. That is, how, how do the genes in the regulation of their expression uh, in, impose on uh, this incredibly complex problem, which you can see is, is a, I equivalent to the branching uh, of arbors of a tree uh, that do not, uh, th that manage to take in the maximum amounts of light in order to uh, uh, feed the tree. So I have to start off with a very simple slide uh, to, uh, to illustrate uh, where we're going with this, and that is, uh, this is uh, the way uh, the nucleus of a human cell is organized. Uh, this is the nucleus, the cytoplasm, and in the nucleus there are chromosomes. This is a metaphase chromosome. And each chromosome uh, has highly compacted DNA, which is bound uh, to proteins. And if you unwind this, you see that there is something called chromatin and nucleosomes. These are histone proteins that bind to the DNA and, and organize and compact it. And ultimately, you see naked DNA, which is the double-stranded DNA, which encodes proteins. So this is the, the complex organization uh, of, of the nucleus. And uh, an underlying question related to what we're going to talk to is, how is the genetic information read out at the right place, the right time? And that's what gene regulation is about. And there's been 50 years of research uh, on this to understand that we're now making great progress uh, in this understanding. Well, and I should say, um, I, I missed a point here, is that the story that I'm about to uh, tell you started in 1999, uh, and it was uh, just about the time that the Human Genome Project uh, was ending in the determination of the nucleotide sequence of three billion base pairs of DNA. And this, this is the Science and Nature magazines that uh, announced that uh, breakthrough. And while that was uh, happening, the data was made available uh, for everyone. And that's really a principle of genomics that we're, we're trying to aspire to, that making this uh, open source data. And we were able to go through and look for a particular gene that we were interested in. I, I won't go into the reasons why we we're interested in. But we were able to go on a database and pull down bits of sequence and then assemble them into a long region. And this region uh, is shown here. So this is how metaphase chromosomes of a human cell looked. And you can see uh, there are two copies of, uh, of each. And on chromosome five, there's a locus which is called the clustered protocoherent genes. This is a multi-gene family. Uh, and it is organized in a remarkable way. Uh, what you see is each of these colored boxes corresponds to a gene that encodes a very particular protein. Uh, and it has uh, both variable exons, and I'll explain what that means, that encodes an isoform of a particular protein. So an isoform is, an, is a very similar protein that has some changes that make it uh, distinct and unique from the others. And you'll see why that's important. And this region uh, spans uh, a million base pairs of DNA on chromosome 5. And so uh, when this was discovered, it, it, it was uh, obviously remarkable. And we had to begin thinking about what this organization meant uh, and what this gene cluster does. I should say that uh, Taikishi Yagi's lab uh, in Japan had uh, identified cDNA clones corresponding to this region. And it demonstrated that, uh, that they have common uh, three prime ends, the, in the ends of the RNA, which uh, is the constant region, which, which I'll explain in a moment. So uh, I'm going to take uh, you through four steps. Uh, the first is the generation of the cell surface identity code, uh, which I'll begin with. The nature and reading of the code, which requires 
understanding where these proteins are made and uh, uh, where they function. The function of the code, uh, and that is in mice, uh, they, uh, they're responsible for self-avoidance uh, and tiling. And then finally, in with the medical implications uh, in uh, neuropsychiatric diseases. So just as a brief primer so that we are all on the, uh, uh, in the same phase, uh, this is how uh, genes look in human cells. Uh, they're not simple linear relationships. They have interruptions in them, and these interruptions are called introns, which is shown here. So the region that encodes a protein is an exon, as you see here, uh, and it's uh, interrupted by introns. And uh, there is a mechanism that, that generates a, a precursor RNA, so it copies this entire region, and then a process called splicing, uh, uh, which generates, in this case, uh, alternatives of uh, different combinations of these exons, as you see here. So one, two, three, four, five, one, two, four, five, so it skipped one. And that encodes then a series of proteins, protein A, B, and C. So this is a, a, a remarkable mechanism that generates enormous uh, diversity uh, in, in the human genome uh, and is, uh, is required for uh, most of the fundamental uh, uh, biological properties that we know about. So uh, let's just focus on one piece of this gene, it's, uh, of this cluster. It's called the uh, proto-coherin alpha gene cluster. And what you see here is that uh, this is the linear array of the gene. These are the coding regions for the protein. And what we demonstrated many years ago, that each one of these coding regions has immediately upstream something called a promoter. And the promoter is where RNA transcription initiates and reads through. Uh, and, uh, and down here, uh, there is uh, a, uh, a three-prime splice site. So there are splice sites in this that are necessary to uh, uh, to, to drive this mechanism that I mentioned before in splicing. And so what happens is transcription begins here. It goes through a, all of these regions. It happens to start at eight. Uh, and then there's splicing between this piece here and this to generate uh, a messenger RNA, which encodes uh, the mature protein. And that's what's shown here. So this is the messenger RNA. It has this variable exon uh, alpha eight and then uh, these three uh, constant regions, which are shown here. And if we look at the protein sequence, what we see is this protein has an extracellular domain, which has uh, six of these uh, domains here, a transmembrane dom domain, and a constant region. And this piece is inside the cell. It's called an intracellular domain. And so uh, the question is, uh, how are these promoters chosen in a, in a, uh, in a particular neuron? Uh, a, a nice example uh, of this is provided by uh, the olfactory system, which, as you know, uh, was uh, discovered uh, by uh, Linda Buck and Richard Axel, which uh, led to the Nobel Prize uh, over 20 years ago. And uh, what this system does is it uh, provides the diversity necessary to detect uh, uh, odors. But I show this because... Um, as you can see here, at the epithelium in the nose, which is uh, right here, uh, you generate a whole series of olfactory neurons, each of which have a different receptor. Uh, they migrate into the brain, and they, uh, they form very specific regions called glomeruli, which are sort of the relay stations to the deep brain that uh, really sorts out this uh, information uh, and to, um, for sensory perception. So if we look at this by using a method called single cell sequencing, and so that's uh, a technology that's really just been developed uh, recently, uh, uh, it's, it, we're able to sort these cells and look at an individual cell and ask what are the messenger RNAs that are present there. And uh, what we see is that uh, these three neurons, which were uh, olfactory sensory neurons, which have different colors, uh, actually express uh, a series of alpha, beta, and gamma protocoherins that are random. So you can see 5, 7, 1, 6, 5, and uh, in this red neuron, uh, this uh, yellow neuron expresses 7, uh, 
eight, eight and ten, and uh, and the uh, corresponding ones here. So each neuron, then each olfactory sensory neuron, is expressing a random set of these genes uh, that are on the cell surface. And so, this the, and so the question was uh, how uh, how is this uh, generated and what does it do? And so. Uh, this is uh, sort of an overview of what happens. Here is the, uh, the again, uh, an illustration of the genes, the maternal and paternal chromosomes. And you can see, uh, you see various promoters firing uh, in each of the two uh, chromosomes in a completely random stochastic way. Uh, they give rise to these transcripts that make uh, these proteins. And you can see that uh, there are over uh, 58 isoforms encoded in about 15 random sets of, of these in individual neurons. And so, what to, uh, so how does that happen? How is this generated? And I need to show you another uh, important fact, and that is the DNA sequence regulatory elements that are required to turn genes on and off. And so what you see here is uh, an important principle, which is a, uh, illustrated very simpler, simple here, is that uh, the copying of the gene, the transcription, occurs uh, at something called a promoter, which is indicated here. And on the promoter, there's assembled a large protein complex, re in which includes the enzyme, RNA polymerase, that generates the transcript, as it's uh, shown here. Uh, and uh, the key is uh, that there uh, highly specific uh, DNA binding proteins called transcription factors that bind to these sequences and thereby activate transcription. And they do that by recruiting the comp components necessary for this assemblage. And so that's the, the fundamental principle that was uh, worked out uh, in yeast, uh, actually by Mark Potashny, and uh, has, been, uh, has been shown to be the case for higher, the highest eukaryotes, uh, including humans. So uh, with that in mind, uh, one of the first things we did was to try to identify those enhancers and promoters within this gene cluster. And this, is, uh, it, this summarizes several years of work and uh, very deep experiments which involve mouse genetics and so on. But uh, the bottom line is that, the, um, uh, is that we identified these enhancers, which are the blue uh, diamonds here, and they're spread throughout the locus, uh, and, uh, and the promoters. And so we have uh, a complete map, then, of the regulatory sequences within, within these clusters to begin to understand uh, how the gene is expressed. So again, uh, a long story, very short. Uh, what happens is that there is an enhancer, it happens to be called HS51. It's located uh, roughly 300,000 uh, base pairs away from the promoters uh, it activates. And uh, we've shown uh, through a whole series of experiments that uh, that occurs, uh, the activation of these genes occurs by uh, DNA looping between the enhancer and, for example, in this alpha-12. In order to do that, there are proteins that bind to the DNA, and they're very specific proteins that do a special job. Uh, they happen to be called HS51 and CTCF, and uh, the purple ones here are uh, the, the, uh, the CTCF site. And these rings are, uh, are the uh, cohesin, which are proteins that wrap around DNA and hold them together. So uh, how does this work? Uh, the, what we're able to do by using various uh, methods in, in genomics to uh, show that uh, CTCF and cohesin bind to uh, the enhancer at two sites. They're shown here, one here and one here. Uh, and they bind to the promoter uh, at two sites, right here and right here. And in between are some of these nucleosomes and other uh, transcription factors. But this is basically the activated state of the gene. So uh, how does this occur? Major advances have been made only very recently uh, in actually Leonid Murney's lab at MIT, uh, which indicates how these, this complex of CTCF and cohesin assembles the appropriate enhancers and promoters uh, to each other. 
And uh, that's a very complex process, but uh, it, uh, I hope to be able to explain how this works, and that is that uh, when, uh, when you see that uh, if there's a CTCF motif here, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the cohesin binds uh, to the DNA, and then it extrudes DNA, it moves it through these rings until the CTCF binding sites come together, and then it stops if there is a CTCF protein bound there. And so it's a, it's a way of bringing the right promoter with the right enhancer at the right time. And so uh, if I could have the video, uh, I'll, uh, I'll show how uh, this actually works. This is a video from the Marini lab. Uh, May I have the video, please? Yeah, okay. Do we have the sound? Okay. Uh, and I should say that uh, this, uh, this shows a, uh, a artist's view of cohesin bound to these uh, two pieces of DNA. So how does this relate to stochastic expression of the protocadherin locus? Uh, again, uh, this is years of work that I'm distilling down to just a, a picture of how it works. So here is the protocadherin alpha gene cluster. And what you see here are the CTCF binding sites that correspond to these two promoters. And the black circles indicate that the DNA is methylated. And I didn't tell you that when the DNA is methylated, CTCF cannot bind. And so when cohesin does its thing, CTCF is not there, so it doesn't uh, make, the, uh, make this loop. Uh, however, uh, if you see uh, if uh, what we've been able to show by using uh, uh, very uh, sensitive genomic methods is that the first thing that happens is that uh, this promoter, which is actually within the coding sequence, is activated and makes an antisense link, link RNA that goes through the promoter upstream. And as it does so, it demethylates this promoter. It takes the methyl groups off so that CTCF can bind. And it does so through an enzyme called TET3, which I, uh, I, I, can't, uh, I don't have time to explain. But now uh, you have both of these sites that are unmethylated, and so CTCF can bind. And when that happens, it binds to both the enhancer and the promoter, forms this loop, and activates transcription. And the remarkable thing is that this is propagated uh, in all the subsequent generations. So if this happens in a early uh, progenitor cell, uh, the, uh, the loop is made, and then it survives DNA replication until you have the post-mitotic uh, neuron. And so it's, it's a remarkable process, and it, uh, and it eliminates any distance dependent because it always is determined by where CTCF is bound. So you can see here, the cohesin keeps moving until it hits the first uh, uh, CTCF bound. And so that, that appears to be uh, how this, uh, this random generation of protocadherins is accomplished. So uh, 
So what does the code do? Uh, the first thing we have to understand is how it's read. I mean, what does it do uh, at the cell surface? And this uh, involves a very productive uh, and several year collaboration with the laboratories of uh, Larry Shapiro and Barry Honig uh, here at, uh, at the Zuckerman Institute. And uh, I wanna quickly again go through this. It's a, a very complicated story, but uh, it really comes together in a beautiful and elegant way. So uh, the protein that's encoded by this cluster is, looks like this. I've shown you this before. There's a part of the protein that sticks inside the cell. It's called the intracellular domain. And then all of these, uh, uh, all of these other domains, which through biophysics, through protein chemistry, uh, 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 their function has been determined. And so this is the dimerization interface where, uh, where two proteins come together. So we discovered that they're not monomers inside the uh, in neuron, they're actually dimers. So there are two of them that stick together. And that uh, what we discovered through a large series of, uh, of experiments is that uh, these are actually protein-protein uh, interaction interfaces. So they're like, uh, they're like Velcro, they stick to each other. But uh, the important thing is that they're very specific. So uh, one protocadherin will interact with only its identity. And so when it's assembled at the surface, it gives a very uh, specific code. And because of this unusual structure, which was worked out through biophysics experiments, through X-ray crystallography, determining the atomic uh, resolution, at atomic resolution, the structure of the proteins, the, uh, what you see is that uh, the, they interact with each other. And because two dimers uh, can interact through these interfaces, they can do this. So it makes a cis-trans tetramer. So that there are now four, but most importantly, they're capable of extending that more or less indefinitely to make a long lattice. And so this, this solved a big problem having to do with the sufficient diversity because now uh, you, you generate these long chains of just incredible diversity. If they don't fit, uh, as I'll show you in a moment, uh, they don't work. So this just shows you uh, with the ability to make these dimers, you can make this huge collection of cis dimers, each one is highly specific. It will only interact with itself. So, and a very important point here, which was uh, established in invertebrates in Drosophila by Larry Zabersky's lab at uh, UCLA, uh, using a completely different mechanism that I don't have time to get into for generating diversity. It's actually uh, the most striking example of alternative splicing. But this is the important point I need to make here and that is that uh, if neurites from the same uh, neuron touch each other, they recognize through these protein-protein interactions, and that leads to repulsion. They push each other away. We don't understand the mechanism. That's the next big step in understanding this problem, but it's a fact. When they touch and they engage, they're repulsed. And so uh, if there are neurites from different neurons, as shown here, uh, they don't uh, form this uh, engagement, there's no repulsion. So this homophilic interaction between distinct protein isoforms results in repulsion uh, between the neurites and the lack of interactions leads to crossover and clumping. So this is a very important experiment, uh, but relatively simple. So what we're doing here is we're taking the coding sequence for these uh, isoforms, we're hooking it to a plasmid and putting it into a cell. And we can lay, label one set with a green label uh, that's fluorescent and one with red. And what you can see is that uh, if uh, you put in exactly the same uh, 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 protocate here in coding sequences, uh, they'll make mixed aggregates if they're perfectly matched between the two. But if they're different, they make separate aggregates. So they, they, can't, they can't form multiple interactions. So uh, the experiment was done, was to test a series of combinations, two isoforms, three up until five, mix them, and then ask whether they do this or this, and then see what happens when you have a single mismatch for the isoform. Uh, 
And this is what happens, and this is uh, really uh, an important result. So what you see here is that this is what happens when a cell is, uh, expresses this alpha B17, B6, and gamma C5. They form these mixed aggregates because they can all interact with each other. However, if we have a single mismatch uh, here, the mismatch is here in alpha 9 and here in beta 18 and so on, you see that they never form mixed aggregates. They form separate. And so what this says is that there is a mechanism that requires perfection in the interaction at the cell surface. It does not allow any mistakes. And that was a, that was a puzzle, but uh, thanks to uh, both theoretical calculations and some biophysics, a proposal was made uh, that, uh, that uh, what's happening here is that since they can form a lattice, as shown here, uh, through these dimers of dimers, uh, when they make a long chain, uh, you see an avoidance signal, uh, and they work. But uh, if you have a mismatch, uh, the, the lattice only uh, extends to a certain distance. And because of that, either because of the, the affinity or the uh, intracellular activation of signaling pathways, it doesn't work. And so it's a you know, sort of a chain termination idea. And so uh, that, was a, that was a proposal, and additional experiments were done. And uh, this is a, a beautiful uh, experiment that uh, Carrie Goodman, a postdoc in the Shapiro and Honig labs, did. She determined the three-dimensional structure of a cis-trans tetramer. And that's shown here. And what you can see that in theory it's capable of making an extraordinary lattice that could be indefinite. And uh, it was this structure, as you see here, that then made it possible to test this idea by putting these into cells and doing something called uh, uh, electron uh, tomography, which I'll show here, and I don't have time to go uh, into detail in this. But uh, what's done is to, uh, is to express uh, this, uh, uh, this protein uh, in a liposome. This is just uh, membranes. And what you can see here is that when you express it and mix these, you can beautifully identify these lattices. There, you, know, you can see them as it's like scanning down through the sections. And I'll, I'll play that again. Uh, and you can see that as you... As you go through the liposomes, uh, you can see these amazing structures forming like this. And uh, because they had the crystal structure, they know the exact dimensions and uh, parameters of the, the protein, it was possible then to, uh, to uh, take those two sets of data and show uh, at a very high level of resolution uh, that, uh, in fact, what happens, they do form a lattice, and this shows uh, an example of uh, how that can form. So uh, the, the idea then, as I said uh, earlier, is that uh, when you have the same neuron, uh, they make this long lattice, and uh, with this intracellular signaling, uh, they uh, avoid each other. And for those that are mismatched, it's below the uh, threshold for signaling. So this is coupling of the protocoherent zipper to structured elements in the cytoplasm, and this mismatch interferes with the localization to contact, and so the signaling is not formed. So you can see that uh, this amazing set of very high-tech, very difficult experiments in structural biology and using the cryo-electron microscope, it was possible to really sort out how these, uh, how these molecules work. So how about the function of the code? Well, uh, in order to study that, we had to go to mice, and uh, that required uh, uh, some uh, manipulations of their genomes. And so uh, this is, uh, this is uh, a, again, uh, the description of the cluster, as you can see here, the alpha, beta, and gamma. And so uh, what we did was to systematically delete each cluster and, uh, and then attempt to demonstrate uh, the function uh, through the effect on wiring in the brain. We do that by CRISPRs that I'm sure everybody in this room knows about, uh, of using uh, these uh, amazing uh, 
complexes that uh, use a guide RNA to specifically introduce a nuclease at a very specific site in DNA. And by having two guide RNAs that recognize the boundaries of each cluster and of the total, cl total cluster, we're able to cut them out. Uh, they're repaired uh, in, in the mouse uh, embryo and uh, result in a very precise uh, targeted deletion. And so this just shows what happens. You take uh, the, 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 the protein that's essential uh, nuclease that has these guide RNAs. You inject them into an embryo, transfer the embryo into, uh, into a mouse, and then generate the progeny. So you can very quickly uh, uh, construct a whole series of deletions uh, that you can then test. So this is what happened. Uh, this is the whole cluster. It was deleted the alpha, the beta, and gamma separately, or the entire cluster is shown here. And I should say uh, it, it took a very long time to really begin to understand how they work, and uh, there are examples in which a deletion of a single cluster has a clear phenotype, but there are examples in which you see no phenotype with deleting any one of the clusters individually, but when you, when you delete the whole locus, you see a profound difference. So I just want to quickly go through that. Uh, this was uh, a, a beautiful uh, demonstration of self-avoidance. Uh, this is the starburst amacrine cells again. And uh, what you can see here is that uh, these cells um, uh, have this wonderful uh, uh, image of a, of a star and that in a mouse in which there was a, a deletion of the protocadherin gamma locus, you can see that everything clumps because these, uh, these dendrites can no longer recognize each other, and so they just clump. And so it's a beautiful illustration uh, of the importance in this case of a gamma cluster. Uh, there was a very different thing seen in olfactory neurons, which is shown here. So we're looking at mice in which we see uh, the uh, olfactory bulb in the mouse, and this is how, in a, in a coronal section, how these glomeruli look. And again, uh, this is how it looks in a normal mouse. Uh, these are the olfactory neurons that are uh, converging to form a glomerulus, and this is the coronal section in which you can see these beautiful uh, globular uh, structures uh, uh, that are uh, they're called uh, glom glomeruli. And so, uh, what we found is that if we delete any one of the single uh, clusters alone, we saw no effect on olfactory uh, wiring. Uh, it was uh, surprising, but uh, we were able to delete the entire cluster, and this is what we saw. So what you can see here is that uh, this is uh, the wild type case. This is a heterozygous uh, deletion in which uh, the entire cluster on one of the two chromosomes was deleted. You still see these nice glomeruli. But in the triple knockout, you can see you no longer see glomeruli. They're completely diffuse. And so uh, we uh, wondered uh, what was happening there. So we, uh, we, uh, we looked at uh, neurons, single neurons uh, in, uh, using a method I'll, I'll mention later. Uh, to actually label a single neuron in the wild type, uh, which you can see here. You see this beautiful extension into the glomerulus. The fingers are separated. But in the tri-cluster deletion uh, in the single neuron, you see it's totally clumped. So uh, this is a, uh, an, an axonal uh, self-avoidance uh, mechanism. And it shows, I think, quite uh, beautifully uh, the importance of the cluster uh, in, the, in the wiring of the olfactory system. So this is the idea that uh, normally in the wild type case, you have this display of uh, protocadherins on the surface of each of, the, uh, of these extensions, and that uh, when you delete them, uh, they clump. And that's what we, exactly what we saw. The wild type looks like this and uh, the mutant uh, looks like this. So uh, another uh, example of this, and it's a cluster that uh, we see uh, a, uh, a phenotype by itself, and uh, this work was also done by uh, Yagi's lab at about uh, the same time. Uh, 
And what we see here is that uh, if we delete only the proto-coherent alpha cluster, and then we look uh, into uh, the hippocampus uh, in a way that we can detect serotonergic neurons, and so serotonergic <laughs> neurons uh, ex extend from uh, a single site, uh, are spread through the brain, and their function is to release serotonin locally uh, uh, to, as a, as a, as a uh, neuro, uh, neuro ligand. And so uh, what you see here is that this is the wild type case. You see they're sort of randomly distributed within the hippocampus, and there are certain regions that can be uh, looked at specifically. But this is what happens uh, in the, in the uh, protocoherent alpha knockout. And you can see, rather than being diffusely spread, they're all clustered, they're clumped in one part of the hippocampus, uh, which is indicated here. So this is a phenomenon that I mentioned earlier. This is tiling. So these are neurons of the same type that are spreading into a, in a region, and uh, they repulse each other uh, in order to make uh, this uniform distribution. So a whole series of experiments was done. And I won't go through this in detail. Uh, this is what happens if you knock out the beta cluster, nothing happens. The gamma cluster, nothing happens. Uh, at, deleting all these alternate isoforms has no effect. However, when you delete these two C types here, you see the, you know, the, the clumping. And we actually were able to show that a single gene, protocate here in alpha C2, is completely responsible for this phenotype. And if we look at the expression, we see that in these neurons, uh, really the only thing that's expressed is uh, protocate here in alpha C2. So uh, there are two separate genes uh, within the cluster. One type of gene, these alphas, are involved in tiling, and the alternate isoforms are involved uh, in self-avoidance. So finally, uh, oh, and I should say a really important point in this, and I'm not gonna go through the data, but when we look at these mice, there are behavioral uh, defects that we can see. And uh, mouse uh, neuroscientists and geneticists have evolved a whole series of assays in mice that mimic, for example, an anxiety and depression. And by that criteria, these mice are very fearful and very depressed. And so they actually have the phenotype that is characteristic uh, of autism. And so, of course, that suggests that maybe uh, uh, in humans, uh, this gene cluster provides the same function. And what you can see here is that <clears throat> thanks to the Simons Foundation and all the work they've done, uh, they've identified a whole series of genes, uh, 150 or so genes, that by virtue of where the, uh, where the mutations occur within family uh, organized cohorts, uh, a number of uh, genes that contain uh, DNA uh, sequence variants uh, are associated with the disease. Uh, they, ha they haven't been shown to be causative yet, uh, but they, they clearly, by all these criteria, uh, are, uh, are involved in the disease. And what you see here, among the various genes on the cell surface, are our protocoherins, the clustered protocoherins, and also these non-clustered as well. And, uh, and so this is uh, from the Simons Foundation website. And if you can see on here, these are all the protocoherin alphas, so this 19, 8, beta, gamma, all through the cluster there are these sequence variants that associate with the disease. And most importantly, you can see right here, protocoherin alpha uh, C2 uh, is, uh, uh, is present. So there's a real connection uh, between uh, the genetic studies uh, that have been done on uh, autism families, uh, the function of uh, this uh, cluster in mice uh, and the, uh, the protocoherin here in locus. So <clears throat> I just want to make one final point, is that uh, very massive uh, studies have been uh, done to look at uh, uh, genetic variation within large cohorts. This particular one is, uh, is in uh, schizophrenia. And uh, I, I, I won't go into explaining this chart, but just to tell you that anything uh, that is above this line here uh, is uh, a possible associated variant that's causal. And what you can see is that in all of these cases, there are sequence variants that correlate with the disease uh, 
all through the proto-cadherin cluster. So the proto-cadherin gene cluster is uh, associated with both autism and schizophrenia, and there are also some variants in bipolar disease as well. So this is one of many genes that are, uh, that are shared in common in these kinds of studies between those three uh, neuropsychiatric diseases. So I just uh, finished by summarizing here. Uh, Proto-coherent cell surface code is generated uh, by stochastic promoter choice through a remarkable mechanism involving antisense RNA transcription, DNA methylation, chromosome looping, and cohesin uh, extrusion. Uh, the structure and homophilic interactions of proto-coherent proteins at the cell surface of neurons allows the identity code to be read through a highly specific interaction. Uh, and this is, uh, as I said, was done really at the uh, atomic resolution. And then finally, the protocod gene cluster functions in normal circuit assembly and behavior in mice, as uh, shown in this experiment here. And that DNA sequence variants in human DNA associate with neuropsychiatric diseases, autism, and schizophrenia. So we go from 20 years ago when we first discovered this cluster through a whole series of basic research on what these genes do, how they're expressed, how they're re regulated, and we end up here uh, really having some uh, very uh, important insights into the genetic basis of these uh, human diseases. So I want to uh, uh, thank all the people who worked on this project over the years, uh, this uh, generating the protein here in identity code shown here. This is Dan uh, Daniela Canzio, who now moved on to UCSF, uh, Chiamaka Nukazi, who's an MD PhD student uh, in my lab, uh, Elliot Coffey, who's now a uh, graduate student at MIT, uh, Sandy Ruckamar, who's at UCSF, and Sean O'Keefe. And uh, we collaborated with the Matt Simons lab at Yale, and uh, in the work that I told you about the CTCF cohesin, we had a very productive and, uh, uh, and wonderful collaboration with uh, Stavros Lombardis' lab, Aidan Horta, Kevin Monahan, and Rachel Duffy. So this, uh, as I say, this was years of work, but uh, it, it required uh, all these very uh, devoted teams. Uh, the structural work was done, as I said, by Larry Shapiro and Barry Honing's lab, uh, and uh, members of their laboratory, uh, A2, and. Maxime Chevet uh, in my lab, and uh, importantly, in the last uh, work that I showed on this uh, cryon tomography, uh, was led at the, uh, uh, through Larry Shapiro in the Honig Labs by Bridget Geriger and Clint Potter at the New York Structural Biology Center and the Simons Electron uh, Microscopy Centers, and these are the people who really uh, did the work. So this is an incredible collaboration uh, using all the latest technology to, uh, uh, to bear on this problem. Finally, uh, all the functional work was done by Wei Xing Shen, who's now at Levergene, George Montalferis, who's now at Caltech, and Chiamaka uh, Chia and Daniele made important contributions along with Sean. And we had a nice collaboration with Frank Pelot's lab uh, with Yusuke Hirabashi, who did the single cell uh, labeling experiments. So uh, with that, uh, I would like to, again, thank the Nyarkas Foundation and uh, remind everyone that the next lecture is going to be given in this series by Jeanette Wing, uh, who is the director of the Data Science Institute uh, at Columbia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, for this fabulous lecture. Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of questions. I, I have quite a few. We're going to have two microphones on the sides. And as usual, uh, we encourage uh, questions. Uh, there can be questions from uh, a lot of you. And we'll stay here until there are questions. So please be <laughs> encouraged. <laughs> so. <clears throat> I can start with one. Okay. So, Tom, uh, you found that one specific uh, protocadherin was responsible for quite a defect in the 
hippocampus. Mm -hmm. So although there's this amazing genetic code for all over the brain, there, there seems to be quite some specificity for which are in which brain areas. Mm -hmm. So th is there some meta-regulation on this? Well, that is really where the research is going right now. And that uh, from the few things we've looked at, there really is cell-specific differential expression of both these alternate isoforms in the C-type. And it's true for alpha, beta, and gamma. And we're just beginning uh, uh, to look into that. And so, for example, uh, dopaminergic neurons uh, make no alpha, OK? Uh, and uh, serotonergic uh, uh, have the expression that I showed. So, what is happening here is that superimposed in all this complexity is the cell-specific differences in the differential use of clusters of alternate and the C-type isoforms. So there's a whole layer of regulatory complexity that's superimposed on this. Fantastic. So any takers? Or is everyone wanting to go home and rest? That was one. That was one. Well, I'm going to say that that was incredibly fascinating. I had no idea that all of that was going on in my, in my brain. <laughs> um, I'm a cognitive researcher, and one of the things that you said in the beginning was bringing different disciplines together. So I'd like to offer you my perspective, um, not on the technical things that you talk about, because I can't touch that. I only have understood like 20% of it. But when you, <laughs> when you migrate into schizophrenia, then that's where I would like to add my comments. I'd like you to, to compare the human brain to a computer system, all right, for this analogy. Uh, your cognition is equivalent to an application program like Microsoft Word. Um, you have a subconscious system like a subconscious execution system, semi-conscious. That's equivalent to the Windows operating system. The hardware architecture of the computer is equivalent to the neuronal processor that you were explaining as to how all of this is put together. And that's your neuronal processor, your memory architecture, and so forth. All right, and then you have uh, on the computer level the off-on circuit control ar architecture, like they're talking about quantum computers and so forth, and that's where you began to talk about neuronal architecture of how, of how they keep away from each other and don't touch each other and so forth. Okay, and then you have the the circuits. Uh, atomic and subatomic structures like uh, the quantum bits and so forth, and that's where you have the genetics and the genomics. Now, with schizophrenia, uh, before I say that, if you have a, a, if somebody hacks into your computer and you have a virus, you're not going to look at the subatomic level. You're going to look at the application, at the operating system level. Schizophrenia is a content, an affected content disorder. You can create schizophrenia. I'm sure there are many hypnotherapists in here. You can create schizophrenia using hypnotherapy, all right? You can create the alter identities, you can create the voices, and so forth, all right? Now, from my perspective, I'll wrap it up. Where I, where I do see this type of, 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 of chunking down right, into what goes on and where in the brain and, and looking for the identity of the neurons and the neuronal processor is in you identifying where, for example, um, uh, voice-based um, neuronal activation is occurring. 
So with all the information that you have, if you can identify that location and then design a, pharma a pharmaceutical solution to stopping that kind of activation, then you can cure your schizophrenia as opposed to using the psychotherapy. Thank you. <laughs> well, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So. <clears throat> We're going to let everyone rest. Uh, thank you, Tom, again for the wonderful lecture. And I hope to see you here at the School of Journalism. Uh, thank you for your support. Please partner with us and see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you.